suffered that we builded the wall. He was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall. And all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. I want to talk to us for just a little while today on the topic of the road to restoration. The road to restoration. Would you bow with me? Master, once again, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for every opportunity we have to come into the house of God Lord, as the time has come that the word of God must go forth, we ask that your anointing and your presence would rest upon your messenger. Help us, God, to deliver this message that you've placed in my spirit for this time. God, let it be a help and a blessing and an encouragement to all those that hear, not only those that are in this room, but God also those that would hear this message one day on the Internet, those that would hear this message by tape all over the world. Master, today we ask that you would just allow a great and mighty anointing to reside upon us. Anoint us to hear. Anoint us to speak. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated this morning. You know, this man, Nehemiah, earned himself a place in history. He even earned a place in the Holy Scriptures with a book of the Bible being named after him. And what did he do to earn this great place of honor in God's sacred hall of fame? He had a burden. Amen. Did you hear me? You know how Nehemiah got this great honor to have a biblical book named after him? It was easy. He had a burden. He carried a burden. Not only did he have a burden, but he carried it through to its logical completion. You know, it's one thing today to carry a burden for the GLBT communities. It's something altogether to have the courage and the drive to do what is necessary until these communities have been restored to their rightful place within the fellowship of God's church. Many are capable of seeing the need but few have the courage to respond to that need and to do all that is necessary to see restoration come and desolation defeated. Our communities have been expelled from the church and told that uh, they are godless and ungodly and evil and foul. And without the moral compass provided by the church, the GLBT community, are all too frequently reduced to a life filled with drug abuse, alcoholism, illicit sexual misconduct, and lawless decadence and despair. There are some folks, you know, that like to put the cart in front of the horse. <clears throat> you know what that means. They turn things around when it's convenient. Some people turn things around and put the cart in front of the horse and they preach that the GLBT communities are godless and, and uh, heathenistic sorts who seek only to serve pleasure and who place no value on higher ideals and spiritual truths. Now, haven't you heard that preach? Haven't you watched TV sometime and heard some preacher tell you that that's what GLBT people are all about? But the funny thing is, the reality is that but when the church has violently expelled you, 
spewing mindless accusation after mindless accusation, it is only to be expected that one will turn to the opposite extreme of righteousness and godliness, as the death sentence has been declared, and by all accounts, no hope exists. When you feel like there's no hope, when you feel like it doesn't matter how I live, I'm going to go to hell anyway. I've been hearing it all my life. So if the preacher's constantly telling me, then what sense is there in even trying to live any kind of a decent, moral, godly life? What sense is there in even trying to please God in your living? Come on now. Amen. It doesn't even make any sense, does it? Because you've been told that regardless of what you do, it ain't going to matter anyway. So I love these preachers get up and say, but gay lesbian people are nothing but this, that, and the other thing, and blah, blah, blah. And I think, well, you knucklehead, if the church didn't treat folks the way it treated folks, then they wouldn't be what you're calling them. They wouldn't be doing what they're doing. They're only doing it because you've left them feeling hopeless and lost, and you've left them feeling like regardless of what they do, they're going to wind up in the devil's hell anyway. Amen. Put the cart behind the horse. Let's put this thing in the right order. Amen. And call a spade a spade. Where else does one turn when the blood of Christ is said to be for them ineffectual? And the grace of God is said for them to be unavailable. I want you to know today, drugs do not refuse anyone. Do you hear me now? Drugs do not say, I'll accept you, but you I don't want. And who, uh, any, all who wish to partake of the temporal peace that drugs offer are able to come and partake because drugs don't discriminate. Alcohol will never deny any individual access to its pleasures and self-medicative effects. When one cannot seek peace in the presence of our great God, why should it be any surprise that they seek comfort in the company of one sexual conquest after another? Well, I've got news for you, my friend, and listen to me now. Uh, even for my most bitter critics, I've got news today. Our God does not discriminate, and His grace is free to one and all who will hear this wonderful message, who will obey this glorious truth, who will receive this liberating gospel, and who will walk in the light, even as Christ Jesus is the light. Amen. My God doesn't discriminate. Don't you tell me drugs are less discriminating than my Jesus is because you're wrong. Don't you tell me alcohol is less discriminating than the gospel is because you're wrong. My Bible tells me in John chapter 3 and verse 16, a verse we many of us have heard since our youth, for God so loved the world that he gave its only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In John chapter 12, verse 46, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am come a light into the world, and whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Acts chapter 2 and verse 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts 10 verse 43, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Peter finally got the point in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, when Peter said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. 
you wouldn't believe this, but I have detractors today. I have folks that violently stand against my ministry because I preach for the benefit of all, but I reach out especially to the gay lesbian community. I get emails all the time just cussing me up one side down the other. You know, it's funny. They don't even have to be Christians and they hate me. Amen. I get all kinds of people. You know, there, there's so much hate out there in our world, it's not even funny. And I get, I'm on the receiving end of so much trash. And sometimes I think, God, if only these people understood that I'm working 45 hours a week on this thrift shop. So I can have the privilege of ministering to people and providing them with a church and a place to go and worship and learn about you and to understand your word. And then I think, well, you know what? That wouldn't make any difference anyway, Angel. You know why? People like that don't care. They can understand everything there was to understand. They don't care. They don't want to understand. They don't want to know. They don't want to have compassion. They don't want to try to uh, understand what's going on. I work myself to death, folks. Most churches, I'm going to tell you, most churches pay their pastor a salary. This pastor doesn't get a salary. I'm working in a thrift shop over 40 hours a week so that I can be here now for you preaching. You know why? Because like Nehemiah, I've got a burden for our community. And I'll do what I've got to do to get the job done. It's not about money. It's not about paychecks. It's not about recompense. It's about there's a great need in our community for people to be restored to their relationship with God and to know that God accepts them as they are. Let me tell you, if God doesn't understand you for who you are, then, honey, God help us because nobody will. Amen? If God doesn't understand you, who you are standing in your shoes right now, then who on earth is going to understand you? The Bible said as far as the heavens are from the earth, that's how much greater and higher God's understanding is from man's. I want you to know God knows every element that makes you you. He understands every single influence that's made you into the person you are today. Do you know that? He understands that. And you know what? I've got other news for you. He doesn't fault you. He doesn't blame you. You see, in the world, a woman can be raped. And the first thing people will say is, well, she was wearing provocative clothes. She shouldn't have been wearing that, or she shouldn't have been wearing this. She was just asking for it. Yes, 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 let's just blame the victim, amen. But I want you to know, there are people in the church world who will stand there and tell you that the only reason that there are gay, lesbian people is because uh, they've been molested as children or because they've had certain sexual experiences or they've had certain, you know, things happen to them in their life and they've been conditioned in this way. If that were true, listen to me, God would not hold you at fault for that. Do you hear me? Some say it's nature. Some say it's nurture. I say, who cares? Because whether it's nature, whether it's nurture, Patrick, God understands it. He understands how and why and when and where we are, who we are, and it doesn't matter to him because God doesn't look at the action. The Bible said God looks at the heart. God doesn't look at what you do. God looks at what motivates you to do what you do. Do you hear what I'm saying now? So we can get all tied up like my detractors. We can get all tied up in semantics, and we can get all tied up and get so caught up in the notion that God is a God of judgment rather than understanding that God is a God of love and grace and mercy. Well, I want you to know my detractors today would say that the message that I'm declaring to you today is a perversion, a diluted version of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
But I'm declaring right now in your hearing that the message I declare to you today is nothing less than the unpolluted, unhampered with, unintellectualized, unreligiousized, absolutely pure, good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This message is powerful. This message is liberating. This message is satisfying. And this message can save your soul if you will only embrace it today. Whosoever includes you and me this morning. Do you hear me now? Whosoever includes you and I. We're in on that. We're part of that. All those scriptures that I just quoted and read to you a moment ago that said, Whosoever believeth on him shall be saved. Whosoever believeth on his name shall receive permission of sin. That includes you. You are a whosoever. I'm going to tell you, I'd like the devil to try to tell me this morning that whosoever doesn't include me. I'd just like the devil to stand up in front of my face and try to tell me and whosoever doesn't include me. Because I'll promise you one thing, one of us is going to hit the floor face first. And it ain't going to be me. <laughs> one of the saddest state of affairs for the church today is when it sits in judgment of others as though they were so ungodly, so unholy, and so filthy that God will relish the day of judgment when he shall be able to unleash his harsh punishment upon them for all their wickedness. Well, how is this sad? You say, well, Brother Mara, how is that sad? When the church sits in judgment of others and, and sees their ungodliness and sees their wickedness and just waits for the day of judgment. How is that sad? I'll tell you how it's sad. It's sad when the church is doing this and at the same time it is every bit as ungodly, as unholy, and as filthy as the greatest sinner in the world. But the church is too blind to see its own hideous condition. That's sad. It's sad when you get preachers on TV. You remember Brother Swaggart, how he used to get up on TV, boy, he could preach everybody into hell but Tuesday. And then all of a sudden, we find out that he has his own little problems. And I'm not judging him in that. Believe me, I'm not trying to criticize the man. That's not what I'm trying to say. But what I'm trying to say is, it's sad when you can sit in judgment of everybody else and all the while you're just as sinful as anybody. But you can't see that. The Roman Catholic Church can make all kinds of edicts and stands against the gay lesbian community. And yet the reality is recent research suggests that possibly as high as 80% of her priesthood is gay. And it's funny how we can sit in judgment of others and yet all the while never see our own dirt. Never see our own filth. Never see our own failings. Never see our own hypocrisy. Amen? I want you to know today the Word of God declares in Revelation 3, 14 through 17, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I want thou wert cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Now listen to this. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. This is the Lord speaking to one of the churches in Asia. He said, y'all sit there and think you're something special. Y'all sit there and think you've got it all together. But if you were seeing what I'm seeing, you'd understand that you folks are miserable. You're in horrible condition. You're naked. You're wretched. You're filthy. My Lord, those are strong words, aren't they? I want you to know God's looking at a lot of churches this morning.
Mark's looking at a lot of churches this morning and he has seen filthy, miserable, wretched, naked people. Amen? Who think that they're something when in reality they're not. And I want you to know today, my friend, this is a sad state of affairs. I want you to know that in today's church world, we have leaders in the Christian community, so-called, who are leading God's people down a path to destruction, leading them into false doctrine, leading them into false practices, leading them into false ideologies, and yet, my friend, they'll stand there and tell you that the church has never been in a better condition and in a better place than it is right now. Amen. You ever stop and watch Paul and Jim Crouch on TBN every once in a blue moon for a few minutes? According to them, the church has never been better than it is right now. But what I see running rampant in the church world today is one false doctrine after another, after another, after another. I see all kinds of heresy. I see all kinds of ungodliness. I see the church imitating the world rather than the world imitating the church. You see, God's people are supposed to live by a different standard and by a different ethic than the world does. In the world, it's dog-eat-dog. Dog. You've heard that term before, haven't you? Dog-eat-dog, dog, you know? In the world, everybody's trying to get something, and they'll tear you up in the process of getting where they're going. They'll step on anybody's face to get where they're trying to go so they can make another buck. But that's not the way God's people are supposed to operate. That's not the way that God's church is supposed to work. We're supposed to do things differently than that. We're not supposed to be motivated the same way the world is motivated. But you know what? You look at a lot of these big ministries today, and I've got news for you. The bigger they become, then the more they must compromise in order to support the work that they're doing. Do you hear me now? All of a sudden, they can't dare take a stand against something in uh, the Roman church that is incorrect and wrong. They can't dare take a stand. you know why? No, we've got too many Roman Catholic viewers that send us money. And if we take a stand, we'll lose all that money. And now, all of a sudden, they're motivated by money rather than by truth. Come on now. Friend, I'm here to tell you, don't let anybody tell you that God's church is in the best condition it's ever been in. God's church is in hideous condition today. And we're here today. See, we're not just here for the GLBT communities. You know what our ministry is all about? It's about restoration. It's about getting back where we ought to be. It's about the church in general being what the church is meant to be. That's everybody, whether you're straight, gay, black, white, cross-eyed, blind, or ugly. Amen. I included ugly for myself, you know. I want you to know today, listen to the story of Nehemiah at the beginning of the book of Nehemiah. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and, and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I want you to know Jerusalem is a type in the Old Testament for God's church. The Bible says the Old Testament is full of types and shadows of things to come. 
And I want you to know Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, is, is representative of the church. And Nehemiah was in captivity to another nation. He was serving as a servant in another country where they had been taken prisoner. And Nehemiah said, when a friend came, he said, listen, you've been through the province of Israel. You've been through Palestine. Have you seen any of my brethren? Have you seen any of my Jewish folks who've escaped from this imprisonment and set up camp? back home where they belong. Have you seen them? How are they doing? And the Bible said the word came back to him, they're in terrible condition. Things are bad. It's not good at all. What about the city of Jerusalem? The great capital of our nation. How's it doing? And the word came back to Nehemiah. The city of Jerusalem is in ruin. It's destroyed. The walls are broken down. It's not even, you can't even occupy it. I'm here to tell you today, it's not just gay, lesbian people that are in bondage. It's not just gay, lesbian people that are uh, serving in lands that are foreign to them. The entire church of Jesus Christ is doing it. Do you hear me now? And there are those few old-timers. You know, I love them old-time Pentecostal people who shout the victory and know how to have church. And I'll tell you what, there aren't very many of them left. But there's a few of them, oh yeah, they're back in Israel. They're back in Jerusalem. They're living in the land of promise. But are they living up to their full potential? No! Because even they're miserable, even they're unhappy, even they're not realizing everything that God has for them. Do you hear me now? So the church today stands like Israel, stands like Jerusalem in the Old Testament in utter ruin. And even those few that are still living within its borders aren't living up to what they need to be living up to. And the rest of us are serving in foreign lands when we need to be home. We don't need to be captive to cocaine. We don't need to be held prisoner by alcohol. What we need to do is we need to find our way back to God. Amen. Now listen to me. God's church, like the nation of Israel, is in a state of bondage. The church is bound by the same standards that the world imposes upon unwitting humanity. The church struggles to become bigger and bigger, failing to realize that the principles of godliness call for quality and not quantity. Amen. God doesn't call us to numbers. God calls us to quality. Do you know if all we ever have in this church is what we had this morning, that'd be all right with God as long as we're living right and doing right. Do you hear me now? He'd be all right with that. We don't have to have a thousand people like Cathedral of Hope. Because just because you've got a, a thousand people doesn't mean you've got God's seal of approval. We're called to quality and not quantity. The church strives to impress with its massive edifices and costly furniture, failing to recognize that John the Baptist ministered to his generation wearing only camel's hair and dining on locusts and wild honey. Hmm. Now, we want our preachers to be all refined. We want our preachers to be wearing... $300 suit. You know, isn't it sad? Think about it for a minute for yourself. Isn't it sad when you find yourself more impressed by a preacher who's wearing a $500 suit than you do a preacher who comes in with a sports coat and a tie and looks nice, but it ain't a Gucci or it ain't Ralph Lauren. You hear what I'm saying? Isn't it sad when you find yourself falling into that mindset? But you know what? God's church has fallen into that mindset. Even my Lord himself stated that he had no place to rest his head. And he had no home of his own. And yet today the church is seduced 
by the worldly doctrine of so-called prosperity. Kenneth Copeland and his crowd preaching the prosperity message. But you know what Jesus said? He said, is the servant greater than his master? Hmm. The Lord lived like a pauper. He ran around without a home of his own. But we're told that as Christians, we're, we're all supposed to be rich, and we're all supposed to be blessed, and we're all supposed to have everything, and ain't none of us supposed to be lacking. Jesus said, the poor you have with you always. He also said, is the servant greater than his master? He said, oh, you think you're going to outlive me? You think you're going to do it better than I did it? You think you can live this life and accomplish more than I did? You think you know a better way than I'm walking? Oh, listen to me. There are still some old-timers who haven't been taken captive or who've been able to free themselves from their captors. Yes, they dwell so happily in Canaan's land, but still they're miserable, experiencing difficult times. And friends, their capital, Jerusalem, is in ruins. The walls of Jerusalem remain broken and ineffective. Nehemiah saw the need. Others may have lived closer to the need, but they didn't take on a burden to see Jerusalem return to her former glory. Jerusalem is an Old Testament type of the church. This is why the city, New Jerusalem, is described in the book of Revelation as one adorned for her husband as she descends from heaven on the dawn of that great millennial morning. As Christ the King establishes his earthly rule and reign. Children, I want you to understand this today. God's church is in shambles. It's in utter ruin. She is not the glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb that she is meant to be. Her walls are leveled. She is defenseless. She is in no position to affect the world in which we live, for the world in which we live has left her desolate and destroyed. The GOBT communities are by no means in a unique position today. Yes, our communities are bound and serving as captives in strange lands, but so are the vast majority of those who today call themselves Christians. They may live in a different city than we, and they may even enjoy more comforts and privileges where they live than we do, but this does not change the reality that they, like us, are still bound, still slaves, still serving a master who is not the Lord of glory. Nehemiah had the burden to see the church, as it were, restored to her former glory. He led the efforts to get the walls rebuilt in spite of opposition and ridicule from nearby enemies. But Nehemiah could not have done the job alone. It was far too big a job for one man to do alone. But when one man finds the courage to lead, sincere souls will find the courage to follow. The people, the Bible told us in our primary text this morning, the people had a mind to work. If you think this work will be done by us sitting idly by and waiting for the walls to rise from beneath the ground, you're mistaken. The people had a mind to work. It takes work. It requires effort. It demands sacrifice. It cannot be done without breaking a sweat, creating some blisters, and even from time to time spilling some blood. I don't know about you. I've done some building projects in my day. They weren't even all that big a building project. I built some altars for the church, and boy, I tell you what, by the time those things were done, I baptized them in blood, because I done poke nails and hammers and screwdrivers and everything else into my flesh. Because any time you're going to do something, it's going to take work, it's going to take effort. Sometimes it's going to take a little bit of sweat. Sometimes it might even extract a little bit of blood from you. But listen, I'm almost done this morning. 
We have a great test before us. But like Nehemiah, I want you to know this preacher has risen to the occasion. When I got a burden, I had a burden for the community for so many years. I've had a burden for this community. I've been doing this kind of ministry for 12 years. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm not saying this, this is not to brag. Some people wouldn't even see it as a brag. Some people be so foolish as to look at this as a negative thing. But I'm going to tell you what, I've never gotten a paycheck in 12 years. I've gotten up and preached sometimes to one, but one or two people. But you know what, I had to preach because those one or two people needed me. I send tapes out. We send tapes out all over the world. There are people that will be listening to this tape that I'm making right now. There are going to be people in Norway. There are people in Africa. There are people in uh, the UK. There are people in Australia. There are people in Germany. There are people all over the United States of America that we send our tapes out to every month. You know why? Because they don't have a church that preaches this positive, wonderful, affirming message like we do, and they need to hear it. And they write me letters and emails and say, Pastor Morrow, can you please put me on your tape mail list? Can you please put me on your tape ministry list? And you know what we do? We put them on our tape ministry list, and we send them tapes. Two ladies in South Dakota just sent me an email recently begging for tapes because they have no church where they're at. Both of them coming from Pentecostal background. I sent them seven tapes. On a 90-minute tape, I can fit, as a rule, two sermons, one on each side, because I always try, don't always succeed, but I always try to preach under 45 minutes. Okay? So if you're wondering, you can look at your watch and say, well, it's getting close to 45 minutes, and that means Brother Ma will be winding up, because I try to preach under 45 minutes or thereabouts. Okay? I sent them 14 messages. They begged me, please, we need something. We're dying up here spiritually. Do you know how much our church charges people for these tapes? Not a thin dime. You don't send somebody an ambulance and then ask them to pay the bill before you give them a ride to the hospital. Come on now. Amen? You don't help somebody and say, now you got to pay me before I can help you. But that's what most TV preachers do. That's what most big-time ministries do. That's what most churches you go to do. Oh, you enjoyed the message the pastor preached this morning? You want a copy of the tape to take home and listen to? Five dollars. Everything's a money-making scheme in God's church. That's why we have our thrift shop, so that we can help to support our tape ministry, so that people around the world, and let me tell you, you, you may say, well, I'm not crazy about this preacher, but there's a lot of people out there that like it very much, and they're very grateful for it, and it helps them a lot. And that's why we have our thrift shop. You see, I've risen to the occasion. I said, Lord, like Nehemiah, I'm not just going to have a burden, but I'm going to respond. I'm going to do something. I'm going to do what I can to see to it that the walls are rebuilt. That Jerusalem is restored to her former glory. I will not be happy until Jubilee Christian Fellowship is a shining example of what God's church is supposed to be. Not just for the GLBT community, but for all the church world. I want straight churches to look our way and say, My God, we need to be more like them. We need to be less judgmental. We need to be less critical. We need to be more open-minded. We need to be more understanding. We need to be more compassionate. We need to be more loving. We need to be like Jubilee. That's what I want to do. I want to ask you today, will you have a mind to work? Will you share the burden and help to make our vision for a restored church, GLBT folks and all, Shining is the bright and beautiful city on a hill, showing the world how peace, harmony, cooperation, and truth make for a cocktail far more potent than any vodka tonic or any crack cocaine mixer. Amen. Will you join me today in accomplishing a task so great 
that our enemies will mock us and our detractors will prophesy doom and despair. Yeah, I got folks out there, just like we read in our primary text today, when they heard that Nehemiah was there rebuilding the walls, they said, ah, even if they get them rebuilt, all a fox has to do is jump up on the wall and the whole wall will fall over. Oh yeah, Morrow's down there preaching that message of his, but you know what? Don't worry about it, because let something happen to him and the whole church will just collapse and fade into the annals of history. I got news for you before this thing's done. I have every intention of making sure that doesn't happen. Amen. By the time I'm done doing what I'm doing in this life, by the time God takes me home, I hope to have everything set up so there'll be a preacher ready to step right in and keep this thing going and just keep marching on in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? For some reason, I'm going to tell you, I preach different this morning than I normally do. I don't know what it is, but I was very, very, very kind of low energy. I guess that's the way the Lord wanted me to put that in today. Amen. Sometimes that's the way it happens. But uh, I invite you, if you're free this evening and you'd like to come to this evening service, you're more than welcome to come. We'd love to have you. Uh, we're going to have a good service tonight. We will have more people. Like I said, our Sunday evening service is better attended. 